Hi, everyone, and welcome to Breaking the Spell. Um, so we have a fascinating guest with us today, all the way from Vancouver, Canada, uh, and he's uh, J J.B. McKinnon, otherwise known as James, uh, and he's the author of a book that I've uh, read earlier this year, which I absolutely love, and I would love you guys to check it out. Uh, and the book is called the, the Day the World Stops Shopping. So I have a copy here. Um, and uh, James is uh, so gracious with us to spend the time with us to talk about the book. So first off, I'd like to say, James, thanks a lot, uh, James, for coming onto the show. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to just uh, introduce James a little bit so that you guys get to know him a little bit better. So like I said, he's the author of uh, this book that we're going to be talking about, but he's also been uh, the author of five different books of nonfiction. So he's an award-winning journalist. Uh, his work has appeared in publications such as The New Yorker, National Geographic, The Atlantic, uh, as well as the best American science and nature writing anthologies. He's the adjunct professor of journalism at the University of British Columbia, where he teaches feature writing. So um, uh, this book, right, The Day the World Stops Shopping, How Ending Consumerism Gives Us a Better Life and a Greener World, it's, uh, you know, a topic that's dear to our hearts. Uh, and it's really like a kind of a thought experiment for James to imagine what would happen uh, to our economies, to our products, our planet. Uh, if we commit to consuming far fewer of the earth resources. Uh, his previous works, uh, which I hope we have some time to talk a little bit about, uh, is The Once and Future World, which is a bestseller about rewildering the natural world. Uh, another book, The 100 Mile Diet with Elisa Smith, which is a rec uh, rightly recognized as a catalyst of the local foods movement. Uh, another book, I Live Here with several co-authors, which is a paper documentary about displaced people his very first book, uh, Date Men in Paradise, the story of a priest assassinated in the Dominican Republic, which won Canada's highest prize for literary nonfiction. So we are so uh, grateful to have an award-winning uh, author to be with us today. Uh, so James, um, so I just wanted to first uh, say that um, what I took away from your book, right, is, you know, a really deep understanding about our com complicity, but also that nobody is an angel when it comes to Consumerism, we all shop and consume to some degree. Um, the psychology of a retail therapy is very real. Uh, you know, we always get a dopamine hit, uh, a sort of a psycho-emotional reward uh, when we uh, possess something new. And uh, you talk about how in the book that when we buy something, it gives us a sort of sense of self-control of our environment. Uh, but the predicament that we're in, right, is that we live in a world of non-finite, uh, of non-infinite resources. Uh, there's real environmental costs and damage to, uh, uh, due to our uh, habits of consumerism. Uh, we also hurt our own communities because of this social hierarchy of inequality about who can own more stuff and whoever owns more stuff uh, seems to get more respect and admiration. And so what I'd like to do today is that um, I, I think we need to recognize that retail therapy needs some psychotherapy. Um, and your book, right, really provides that uh, excellent overview of, of that problem. Um, and the other thing I just want to say also is that for many people out there, like when they try to um, address a question which is as pro profound as this, right, about consumerism, materialism, um, I mean, what, your book is one of the best accessible books out there. Um, it's easy to read uh, and it's so, um, you know, like, like for most people, maybe it's hard for them to read a theoretical economic textbook about this, but, you know, your book is filled with anecdotes. It's very interesting and unique. Uh, and I really like the idea that you travel around the world. So that way it gives people who don't have opportunities to travel, such as me, <laughs> a chance to kind of experience different cultures and, and to, of course, pick up very different themes and ideas and, and look at solutions from all kinds of angles. Um, so uh, the other thing I just want to say is that I, th I think you have a very realistic take also on uh, the human impulse to consume. And uh, it does seem like we can sort of never get away from consuming because uh, to some degree it provides us some, like his, as I mentioned, psycho-emotional therapy. Uh, but we have to come to terms with it and, and find better ways to, to, to design society around, around this. So, James, my, my first question to you, which is our standard opening question to our guests, is when was the first time you realized something was not right with the world? And you can connect this to this book or maybe to your previous books as well. And uh, as an extension of that question, you know, what got you started to, to write about the day the world stopped shopping? Well, if we really want to go back to when I first realized there might be something wrong with the world, I probably have to go back to about grade five. <laughs> and uh, Sure, go, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's uh, maybe even earlier than that. I mean, I was raised in a family of, uh, well, where my parents were really interested in 
in questions particularly of social justice and later on in my life in the environment. So I can't even really think of a time when I wasn't aware that there was something wrong with the world. It was kind of when our family sat down to eat dinner, we, we sat down and ate and debated about the state of the world as, as for as far back as I can remember. Um, but I distinctly remember at around the age of five, when I first kind of took my own independent, uh, my first, or sorry, around grade five, when I, I sort of found the first subject that I independently of my parents became attached to, and that was the campaigns to save the whales that Greenpeace had launched. And, uh, and so from that point forward, I think I, I was maybe more interested uh, I remained interested in social justice, but I was particularly interested in the state of the environment. And so leaping forward to this book, um, at the time that I set out to write this book, I've, you know, I'd been working as an environmental journalist for quite a number of years now. And I began to realize that it really didn't matter which environmental crisis or challenge I was looking at. If I looked at the root causes of it, uh, consumption was right there at, at the roots of, of almost all of these things. And uh, you know, it struck me that as a society, we tend, to, we tend to look at these environmental crises in quite a different way. You know, we will look at deforestation and say that it's driven by um, lumber production or it's, well, even more so, we'll just say that deforestation is driven by logging. You know, we, we won't say what, what the trees are cut down and turned into, or we'll say that um, carbon emissions are driven by, uh, by the burning of fossil fuels, but we don't say that, uh, you know, that the burning of fossil fuels is driven by this, this economy, this global economy that runs on, on consumption. So uh, it struck me as a topic that really needed really needed to be addressed in in some way again we really haven't been talking about consumption as a problem for about 20 or 25 years and um, I set out to do it as a thought experiment because I thought uh, that it, it would be readable and engaging and accessible for readership I was really pleased to hear you say that uh, that you found that the book was those things and uh, yeah it's it's my best crack at getting people talking about the subject again yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to start with something light first to, to talk about, right? Because you did travel around the world, right? And mm. the book is all about shopping, right? So, <laughs> you know, according to, um, you know, some articles that I picked up about Singapore, so I'm um, just quoting directly, shopping in Singapore is one of the best experiences to have in the country. It's one of the world's best destinations for shopping paradise. So my question to you is, why did you come down to our little country here? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, mean, I probably should have, you know, but I mean, I, I do have the United States right next door and they, they are still the world's greatest consumers and the greatest shoppers. So uh, I guess I feel like I had the, the box already ticked of, of you know, mm. hot, hot, sh hot shopping destinations right next door. And really, you know, Canada, of course, where I live is, is also a very consumeristic country. But um, uh, I mean, I would love certainly to have gotten to Singapore and, uh, and, and seen you know, a, a world-class shopping destination in action. Right. Um, so I want to start with some very strong quotes from the book, which I love, you know, it's the way you started uh, the book with, and it helps to set the mood, right? So I'm going to read a few quotes that you wrote. Uh, from, so from Seneca, he says, it is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more that is poor. Uh, in, from the Bible, Luke 12, 15, then he said to the crowd, Take care to guard against all greed, for though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. Uh, from uh, James Baldwin, people are drowning in things. They don't even know what they want them for. They're actually useless. You can't make love to a cardiac, though everybody appears to be trying to. Uh, but you ended that with a quote from George W. Bush, which is, I encourage you all to go shopping more, right? And I think, you know, like when reading this series of quotes, uh, it's a pretty deadening picture of where we are in. And I think uh, the scary thing is that more people sympathize with George W. Uh, Bush quotes uh, versus the previous statements that I just cited. And I, and I think that the funny thing is that um, as I'm reading this, right, I do think that intrinsically, which is something you talk about, intrinsic versus extrinsic values, 
I think people do understand the, the quotes, the, the, the earlier quotes, which is that material possession doesn't really add anything meaningful to our lives. But, you know, at this time of uh, anxiety and crisis, we just can't seem to be helped uh, to be drawn to consuming. So my, my big question first to start with is, has writing this book restored your faith that actually people can extricate themselves from uh, a consumerist mind trap if they try hard enough? I mean, I definitely think people can. And I just think that we need to talk about consumption in a bit of a different way than we have throughout history. So those quotes were partly to give an indication to the reader that throughout history, there has been this long continuity of criticism about consumption and materialism, and that it really is only in recent history that those, that those kinds of voices have really faded to the background. And you know, we've, we've seen about, as I say, 20 or 25 years of really just a continuous uh, aggravation, I suppose, or an acceleration of materialistic values. And, and they have become as central as they have ever been at any time in history, I think, to, to our culture. But you know, those quotes, I think, also help remind us that there have been all of these times throughout history when people have challenged the idea of consumerism. And uh, you know, as I point out late in the book in particular, whole movements, right? I mean, significant movements have challenged consumption and consumerism, um, even in the recent past. I mean, if we look at uh, uh, the hippies in the 1960s, there was a strong strain of anti-materialism there. There was the emergence of the environmental movement in, in um, the 1970s, you know, at the time of the Club of Rome and when a whole lot of people were suddenly waking up to the idea that the planet had finite resources, you know, that, that was all happening in the 1970s and people were concerned about consumption at that time. In the 1990s, we saw the downshifting and voluntary simplicity movements that were primarily, I think, expressed in, in uh, North America and the United Kingdom, uh, though I think it influenced Western Europe as well and, and possibly beyond. But that was a very significant movement. I mean, I, I remember that one. And uh, I remember, for example, it, the sense that it was deeply uncool to conspicuously consume in that era. But all of that ended uh, you know, sometime around the turn of the 21st century or uh, approaching that. And we have had just this continuous sense of well, a deepening of materialistic values and consumer, consumeristic values since then. But all of that history strongly suggests that we, you know, we have it in us <laughs> to, ch to challenge consumerism. Uh, guys, you wanna ask something first? Um, yeah, no, sure. For, uh, first of all, I, I love the title of the book, and and even though you've been talking about uh, consumerism, consumption, I love the word. I love the fact that you use the word shopping because I think uh, shopping is yeah a put, a very specific manifestation of consumption, and I think your book does a really good job of diagnosing you know just the different aspects of what makes shopping. Um, so wicked in a way. Um, mm. uh, so uh, I haven't read every part part of the book, um, but I think uh, you know I, I I like your conceit of using the pandemic as uh, as a way to engage to you know launch into this thought experiment of what would happen if the world stopped shopping. And you know, I, I think in, in the book you, you do talk about the fact that during the pandemic, shopping did seem to have slowed down. Um, but on the other hand, I have I have read like some uh, reporting recently, you know, about let's say the whole um, uh, transportation and container issue in the U.S., where you know you have all these ships that are just stuck off the coast of the U.S. waiting because there are not enough containers and. Uh, I think these reports were saying that during the pandemic, because people were forced to work from home, they actually they they actually ordered a lot of stuff uh, to bring in into the homes. So yeah, I, I was curious whether you know, looking back on balance, do you think the pandemic has actually reduced consumption or increased it? It did both, in a sense. I, I think the part of the pandemic that was really really interesting in terms of imagining a world that slows its consumption 
the the part that was most interesting was the the earliest weeks and months when the pandemic was such a shock to the global system and so many people were literally locked out of consumer culture and that was the period where you'll remember you know the blue skies the bluer than blue skies over so many of the world's cities and and particularly these dramatic changes in air quality in in a lot of the cities, many of them in Asia, where many of the world's consumer goods are produced. Um, we saw you know, that resurgence of the natural world, the deepest and uh, sharpest drop in carbon emissions ever recorded. I mean, all of those things happened in the very early portion of the pandemic. And um, so that part really did resemble the set of ideas that I was exploring in the book. But you know, as I point out at the end of the book, we have this pattern through history where we do see these slowdowns in consumption, sometimes because of, you know, sometimes because of uh, values changing and a movement, in a sense, like away from materialism, uh, more often because of, say, a war or a recession, we see these slowdowns in consumption. And what inevitably happens after them is a resurgence of consumption. Uh, so inevitably in each of these cases we we come back strong to consumption and in fact break new records each time and that's precisely what's expected to happen in 2022 we will set new records for consumption in in 2022 uh, most likely so this is this is the pattern and i think what happened in the pandemic is that you had this brief period where people couldn't access consumer culture and, and uh, consumer culture hadn't figured out how to access people in their state of quarantine and lockdown, but it very rapidly reoriented. And you know, the delivery of everything um, became possible. Advertising started to target people in their, you know, even in their quarantine circumstances and people rushed back to what they know best. There's the comfort of consumerism, which is, what most of us have been brought up in since birth at this point. So um, none of it was really surprising to me, but I still thought that, that that brief window, that brief genuine slowdown in consumption was really fascinating and, and, uh, and illustrated a lot of the points that I'd been exploring in the book. So that, that brings me to what I want to ask you, leading on from uh, my earlier question, which is, what has been the reactions to your book, um, say from people that you do know? So perhaps your social circle, um, the inter intellectual community, whether it's in Canada or North America. And, and I understand that for you, right? Like, because um, I've listened to a couple of your other talks that ironically, what the book has done for you is that it's made you feel a little bit less guilty uh, of being a consumer. Because uh, uh, you can see that you're just a small player in, in, in the big system and you recognize um, the ubiquity of uh, consumerism in every culture across history. Uh, but what about those who, you know, people who are trying to struggle with uh, consuming less or they are very antithetical to your message? I mean, how, how have their reactions been? Uh, I mean, in my social circle, I mean, I think, I think it's actually really interesting because, I mean, I, I think the people that I, that I know and who surround me generally, I mean, they support the work I'm doing they think that it's an important subject to explore. I don't think it's affecting their consumer behavior very much. <laughs> and I do sometimes wonder, you know, if I, if I can't change the behavior of my closest friends, then, then um, you know, how, how well am I going to do on a planetary scale? But um, I mean, I, what, I, what I'm certainly most excited about is the fact that there is there seems to be tremendous interest in talking about this subject and it crosses political lines which is uh, increasingly rare I mean I think you can find people on the right and the left uh, and, and everything in between who are genuinely concerned about at least some aspects of consumption and consumerism um, but they don't really know what to do and I think a lot of them fall back I mean certainly most people fall back on this idea that that George Bush uh, was the first to really articulate for a global audience, which is that we have to keep consuming because it, we have a we have an economy that's designed to to you know, consumption is its fuel, and if we take our foot off the gas pedal, then the engine sputters to a halt, and 
you know, we start to slide into really serious economic circumstances. So um, I think people, you know, people have really embraced that message at this point in history. And, and yet they, they feel a sense of disquiet about it at the same time, because they, they can see that, uh, that consumerism has tremendous consequences for the environment and even, uh, well, for society and for themselves. Yeah, so I'm really hoping that with this book and what we're going to talk about uh, uh, pretty much around now uh, would help to really expand uh, people's awareness and knowledge about the ramifications. Because, I, I mean, you know, there's really nothing much else we can do. On our show, sometimes we talk about philosophically the idea of like uh, knowledge versus emotion, you know, whether rationality can help uh, change people's behavior. So I'll say we're going to take a much more rational approach uh, with what we're doing today. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I think it cannot be denied that yeah, emotionally speaking, it's a very huge uh, factor as to why we consume so much. And um, maybe at the same time, we can try to uh, change our emotional reactions to consumerism. That's what I would like to do today. Uh, before I get into the themes of the book, uh, Ong Su, Santosh, any questions first before I go into the next theme? Uh, yeah, um, I just had an insight. So hi, James. It's been very insightful listening to your thoughts and the conclusion that you made that consumption can be the root cause of everything. Uh, I've been trying to be a bridge between uh, knowledge from the East and the West, the ancient uh, knowledge systems, as well as modern science. And this journey of being a bridge between East, West, ancient and modern uh, has led me to understand a bit more the workings of the mind, particularly in the field of uh, Buddhist philosophy or yogic philosophy. And quite recently, with my recent discovery of polyvagal theory, what I've come to realize is consumption is a perfectly normal and acceptable and helpful response of the nervous system to self-soothe itself and to regulate itself. It's a, it's a very helpful response when we come from a field of compassion to understand that the body is trying to consume in an attempt to self-soothe the, the nervous system and to regulate itself, then only can we wean off the addictive behaviors of consumption and uh, digital device addiction and any other forms of addiction to look for healthier, more wholesome ways of soothing the nervous system and regulating the nervous system. And there are many alternatives, healthy alternatives, deep breathing, breath work exercises, mindful practices, or meditation, somatic experiencing, uh, trauma release, so this is where I've realized that we can actually create a huge, tremendous behavioral shift by getting people to tune in to their unregulated nervous systems and to find a way to regulate themselves and to soothe their nervous systems back to normalcy. And for me personally, I'm just next week from Tuesday to Thursday, I'm tuning out of this world. I'm not mm -hmm. going shopping. I'm not... I'm not going on the internet. I'm doing a silent meditation retreat. And I'm doing what we call sensory deprivation. I'm going to deprive all of my senses of all the stimuli and battle what ensues after that, withdrawal symptoms. Mm -hmm. Tremendous amount of withdrawal symptoms will happen. Grieving and petty, like crying and, you know, frustrations and all just in an attempt to regulate back my nervous system yeah mm -hmm. with breath work exercises and yoga yeah and what i realized is just the past few weeks my mind has been not very centered and grounded and i noticed an increase need and desire to go to the fridge just to take something out of the fridge to soothe my nervous system by swallowing a piece of dark chocolate for example or a food mm -hmm. or anything else so I'm observing myself and I'm realizing there's just so much that I need to work on myself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot there that, uh, that you're exploring and experiencing that 
I'm frankly not that familiar with, you know, <laughs> but, uh, um, but I appreciate the, the, the sensibility of it in, in the sense that, you know, I, I became considerably more, uh, more empathetic around consumption by d researching this book. I mean, I, th I don't, I no longer buy into this idea that people are, uh, that people consume because they're inherently greedy, for example, or covetous. Uh, I think sometimes consumption is expressed that way, but I don't think it's the main motivator. I think the main motivator is things like uh, we use it to comfort ourselves. We use it to, I think particularly, we use it to integrate ourselves into a, into a, com a consumer society. I mean, if we live in a consumer society, um, everyone around us is using consumption for all kinds of central purposes, like expressing their identity or, or as you say, um, comforting themselves, or as Douglas said, therapizing themselves. Um, we use it to mark the milestones of our lives. We use it to mark the holidays of the year. We use it for so many different purposes. We use it to you know, show affection uh, through gift giving. We use it for all kinds of different things. It's just that at this point, uh, we use it excessively. And we, you know, we don't have as uh, holistic a, an approach to life as, as we probably had in the past. Um, you know, we are, we, we've created a system that is just so focused on this one particular way of accomplishing basically everything, <laughs> uh, uh, everything that we need to socially express that we, you know, we've ended up with, uh, with a bit of a hollowed out, I think, uh, culture and one that has tremendous detrimental impacts in, in particular fields and especially when it comes to the environment. But, you know, I, I think the point you're making maybe is that um, it certainly doesn't, it doesn't stop at the environment and it goes, you know, deeply into ourselves as well. I certainly wouldn't yeah. disagree with that. Yeah, and on that note, actually that's one of the questions that uh, I wanted to ask you because you pointed out, right, like uh, say during the pandemic, so a lot of people were cooped up in their homes and they found different sort of uh, self-fulfilling self activities to do and you use the example of baking bread, <laughs> something that right. I did see in a lot of my friends as well. Uh, but you, you pointed out also paradoxically that um, this act of baking, which is meant to be a act of uh, self-reliance, but it actually became a competitive marker of status, ambition and accomplishment on social media. And, mm -hmm. and the other example that you use also is fitness, which I'm very familiar with. Um, and so I, I guess the argument that you're trying to make is that while... Uh, people will try very hard to make uh, uh, promises to stick to intrinsic values, uh, spend more time with the, with the people that they care for, uh, you know, have greater balance between work life. Uh, but in reality, we, we do fall back on these familiar patterns, which you just said is very, this machine that we're in is very efficient at converting something that can be intrins intrinsically self-pursued, but it becomes uh, an extrinsically motivated uh, activity. Uh, and so just to quote directly from your book, you said, Many people are skilled at marketing themselves, but not at developing deeper relationships. They're expert at finding clothes on Amazon, but incompetent at growing their own food, uh, something we can't do here in Singapore. Uh, they can juggle a schedule, a uh, pack of activity, but they can't sit quietly with themselves for longer anxiety, which obviously Santosh is very uh, adept at doing instead. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess my, my question to you, James, is that, you know, um, how should people recognize that? Like maybe that they're pursuing something that they think is intrinsically motivated, but actually it's turned a different, it's turned into a different animal. I almost feel like you should be asking Santosh this question. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I think that, uh, uh, how do people recognize it? I mean, uh, I think certainly awareness, awareness of materialism is, is probably the primary way that we can that we can accomplish that, and you know, just understanding that materialism. I think a lot of people, when they hear the word materialism, they they think of the most materialistic people, right? Like they think of people who are entirely consumed by uh, by matters of income and possessions and social status. And of course, those people are profoundly materialistic. But I think we don't recognize as readily that all of us. Um, have been raised in materialistic cultures or nearly all of us around the world. And, um, and 
that it's all of those things are expressed in us in myriad ways. And, you know, in the writing of this book, I certainly have looked at my, you know, myself in that regard and found myself to be more materialistic than I had anticipated. I mean, um, I certainly have competitive, you know, status, status competition it does not leave me unscathed. Uh, I certainly know that I have um, purchased things because I feel like I need to, to, to maintain a sense of dignity in uh, the, uh, the city that I live in, that is one of the wealthiest and most materialistic cities in the world at this point. Um, I'm, you know, I struggle. I, I, I'm a renter in this, in this city um, where, you know, really home ownership is the marker of success. And I feel some shame about that. You know, there are, there are all of these little things that I have come to recognize as materialistic, but only because, you know, I've been learning more about what materialism actually is and how it's expressed and how it is, how it is a basic fundamental um, value set that we all participate in to some, to some extent. So I, I think just, uh, you know, becoming aware it is really essential as a, as a first step and hopefully having more people in the culture become aware so that we do not, for example, um, send a thousand likes over social media to somebody who is clearly, uh, who is clearly conspicuously consuming or over consuming publicly, um, who is showing off essentially their wealth and their their privileges in a way that's going to make other people um, feel lesser than. I mean, I, we, we really shouldn't be admiring these sorts of behaviors. And there have been plenty of times through even fairly recent history where, where those sorts of behaviors were not that acceptable, um, even in nations like the United States. Yeah, you, you had one example, uh, which I'd like you to expand on, which was, uh, you said that there was this particular uh, wealthy social influencer uh, who was showing off pictures of him being on a yacht in the Caribbean during the pandemic, and he got shouted down basically on social media. Uh, you, you point out, obviously, that, uh, you know, if it wasn't a pandemic, this kind of behavior would have been highly admired and uh, modeled after. And, you know, my, my sense of thought, which I'd like to bounce off you, is that I think what's lacking right now uh, which is something that you do talk about. You, you mentioned how we need to have more public conversations about the unacceptability of certain styles of consumption, right? Obviously, this very unequal, uh, disproportionate level of consumption. But I, I'm thinking like even conversations in themselves are pretty ineffective because in the first place, governments aren't going to host that kind of platforms. And the kind of mm -hmm. conversations we have on such a small scale, they don't have a wide enough, large enough um, scale, scaling effect. So what I'm actually more interested in is whether we can build and develop a alternative um, popular culture of shaming um, um, this kind of individuals. And, you know, I'm thinking of the likes of like Kim Kardashian, you know, Elon Musk, uh, all these people that we currently revere, uh, but, you know, we need to develop alternative uh, exemplary models uh, of success and virtue against um, this sort of people. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that actually is, a significant part of what needs to happen. I mean, lots of things need to happen to change a consumer culture. I think uh, individuals need to engage with it. And one way that individuals can engage with it is by changing some of their own behaviors. I say that while also wanting to say that I don't feel like each individual person should feel like they carry the burden of responsibility for transforming consumer culture. But, but you know, engaging, engaging with the desire to change it through, through change of changes in some of your own behavior is important. I think we probably do need to find ways to make it less socially acceptable um, for people to role model grossly uh, unsustainable lifestyles and, you know, and to par participate in what we have always known to be um, conspicuous consumption. And, and we've always known that to be unhealthy, I think. Uh, but for some reason in the last 20 years, it's become just absolutely normal for people to do it. And as you, as you say, it doesn't seem to come with any social consequences. And then, of course, I think we need to start looking at how to tinker with the system so that it is less dependent on, um, on more and more consumption every year and makes it easier for all of us to consume less. But 
going back to this kind of middle bandwidth where we're talking about, for example, influencers and celebrities. Um, I mean, I think in the same way that um, that 20, like 20 years ago, nobody was really talking about sustainable lifestyles, you know, particularly much at all, right? I mean, we certainly weren't talking about needing to be using renewable energy or um, energy efficient goods or organic products or things like that. And we're now at a place where even most celebrities need to at least make a token nod to the idea that they are that they are trying to live green in some way, right? We've created this model where, you know, I call it green consumerism, where you can still be completely consumeristic, but you can you can kind of say that well, this part was um, this part is organic, my food's organic, and my flights are are carbon neutral because I offset them and my house has a solar panel. You can do all of these sorts of things, right? Um, I would like to see the same, that same kind of pressure put to bear, but around the reduction of consumption. And you know, I don't think there's any kind of magic to it. I think it's just, we have more and more conversations like this one, more and more people become engaged with the idea that reducing consumption is the most effective thing we can do in terms of uh, protecting the planet in particular, that it's important socially as well. And those conversations turn into uh, a little more noise on, on the, uh, the internet platforms that are so critical to the um, celebrity culture and kind of influential, in, influencer culture. And there are at least some hints that that is starting to happen. I mean, um, I do see people starting to question, for example, the number of flights that... Uh, that professional athletes might take or that professional adventurers take or, uh, or even celebrities to some extent. So you see it's starting to happen, but you know, we are in, I think we, it, we can only say that we are in at best early days in a, in a new movement that, uh, that challenges, that challenges consumerism itself. Um, so you want to ask something first? Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I do wonder like, uh, how far you can go in, on shaming tactics. Like I, sometimes I, I just feel shaming isn't sort of like the best way to, to go about changing behavior. Um, I mean, my, my personal experience has been that, um, you know, personal transform, transformative experiences have been the most powerful in shaping my own behavior. I think a, a turning point for me, for instance, as Douglas has mentioned, uh, in my late 20s, I did a documentary on Burning Man and so, yeah, I, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Burning Man, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, going there was an eye-opening experience for me because, you know, for one week, it, it really is a place where no one shops. I mean, you know, everything right. is based on a gift culture and also there's no advertising. Um, and so it, it was really just being immersed in that experience that actually gave me the perspective or the tools to question my own consumption um, mm -hmm. but you know, the, I think the, the paradox of Burning Man is that in order to create the Burning Man experience, lots of people actually do a lot of shopping to <laughs> yeah. buy the things to bring into the desert. Um, and so there, there are a lot of people, um, who have experienced the Burning Man experience who are then trying to figure out, okay, how can we turn this into a year round thing so that it's not just for that one week, but. You're, you're really trying to expand that into other dimensions of, of your life. Um, and that's something, yeah, I've been thinking about ever since going to Burning Man, like how can I create those experiences for other people? Uh, and it's particularly challenging in a place like Singapore, which I mean, really this is, I think one of the hearts of consumerism. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing can be done without, you know, uh, paying a fee or buying something or buying a good or service. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of a, a tough challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually agree with you on shame as well. I mean, I think shame has limited, it has limited uses. I think it has, uh, I think that because celebrities and influencers are such, uh, they are such role models, right? Like they, they, they are something, they live lifestyles that many, many people look up to and, and uh, idealize really. And 
you know, were those lifestyles to become more modest, it would be a tremendous help to, to, uh, to shifting culture towards a more modest approach to, to consumption overall. Um, it would be nice if some of that happened organically through, you know, just through a broader conversation around consumption and seeing some celebrities wind down their, their consumption accordingly. Um, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me if, if shame ended up being a part of that at some point of the, the transition, and it certainly can be powerful. But what I find really interesting is that if you look at the, you know, the history of say the 20th century in, uh, in Western Europe and North America, which are the circumstances I know best, um, you see these long periods where the wealthy were not able, did not feel socially uh, able to conspicuously consume in the way that they do today. So they certainly didn't do it in the 1930s when so many people were clearly struggling just to make ends meet, right? Uh, the wealthy had to, had to kind of put their, their money into hiding a little bit and you know, they didn't drive around in fancy cars and they certainly weren't living the 1920s, roaring 20s lifestyle in the 1930s. Uh, same during the war years. Even during the 1960s, when there was a, when popular culture and the hippie culture were kind of questioning all things to do with uh, power and organization and uh, materialism, even then there was this retreat from the public sphere of exhibitions of wealth. Um, but right now we have the worst of all worlds, really. I mean, we have terrible economic inequality, huge gap between rich and poor, and, and um, absolute cultural approval for the, the gaudiest shows of wealth. <laughs> and you don't see that as much in, in more equitable nations. So, you know, in the Nordic states, for example, it's still the case, despite a pretty significant rich poor gap in those countries, it's still the case that it's not, not nowhere near as publicly acceptable to show your wealth as it is in, in the United States. So, um, yeah, I think, but in terms of transformation, um, the, one of the most, for me, one of the most moving experiences in the researching of this book was the time I spent in the borough of Barking and Dagenham outside of London, where they are, uh, they've launched the world's largest experiment in participatory culture. And this is not Burning Man by any stretch <laughs> on, on the streets of, of, of Barking and Dagenham, but it's similar in the sense that uh, what they've done there is set up what they somewhat ironically, I think, call shops. And except that if you go to these shops, there is nothing for sale. What there is available in these shops is many, many opportunities to engage with your community, to, to teach your own skills to people in your community, to learn from other members of your community, to organize with other people, to create um, uh, meals or to transform the actual landscape of the community, to, you know, ju just to do whatever, you I mean, organize a dance, um, but it basically all happens without money exchanging hands. And the express aim of this is, is to create a different social role than the role of the consumer. And what I find, again, very interesting about this experiment is that they didn't launch it in some middle-class suburb of London. They launched it in, um, you know, by income, the poorest borough in the London area. And part of the reason that it has found success there is because, you know, that as I kind of struck me, um, struck me dumb almost when I, when I realized it, uh, it really drove home to me that if, if you don't have a lot of income in a consumer culture, there's nothing much to do. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine uh, through your description of Singapore, what it must be like to be very low income in Singapore. If, if there's really nothing available to do that doesn't take the expenditure of, of cash. Um, so yeah, London, London uh, or Barking and Dagenham in London was just very, very profound for me to, to see it in action to see this different social role that's possible and to see how important it was to at least some people. I mean, it was, it was a point of connectivity with community like many of these people had never experienced before uh, and inclusion. 
and uh, really like um, brought me close to tears more than once, just seeing how powerful it was. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Is it a, is it a year round thing or does it only just happen in a specific period of time? Yeah, it's, they're running it. Um, they've been running it now for about three years. And uh, I mean, I think their hope is not only that it will become permanent, but that it will, that it will spread to other communities. And I know uh, there, there are other communities that are trying to launch similar experiments here in Canada. I think the city of Halifax and uh, I think part of one, one neighborhood of uh, Montreal. Um, anyway, there are various, there are various communities around the world that, that are kind of seeing whether or not they could launch a similar kind of similar kinds of projects. It's an experiment. And at this point, they don't really know how long it can be sustained. Um, right now it's supported by outside funding. Uh, how, you know, how, how that becomes long-term sustainable is not yet clear, but, uh, but it's a pretty exciting thing to observe right now. Yeah, I, I mean, actually, the reason why I talk about shaming is because I think it's a very powerful force uh, when you see social movements like Me Too, BLM, and I think that's the kind of gravitas that I want um, society to have to uh, 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 uphold and to, um, you know, uh, brace forward with when it comes to um, this particular question. And I like what you said, James, about how uh, when we look at human history, it hasn't always been the case that the wealth have been uh, given um, the uh, excuse to be able to flaunt their wealth. And I think we just need to, in some way or another, uh, reclaim back that kind of cultural norms. Uh, and in terms of personal transformation, I mean, I'm just going to say, I don't think I'm banking on Elon Musk, Kim Kardashian, we have personal transformations. So, so that's, that's not something that I, I have a lot of hope in. But I, I do maybe, maybe Leonardo it. DiCaprio. Right, yeah, DiCaprio and, yeah, and you can just think of anyone else that, that may seemingly have very good intentions. I mean, lots of celebrities... Yeah now try to market themselves as UN ambassadors on inequality and racism, et cetera. But, you know, um, at the end of the day, you have to really examine their lifestyles. And so yeah. that brings me to my next question, because I think this is a good way to kind of uh, uh, differentiate, okay, what is an acceptable form of uh, consumption? So in one chapter of your book, uh, you went to uh, Ecuador, right? And uh, you talk about how the consumerist lifestyle there is something that's globally replicable, right? And uh, it would fit the consumption pattern to fit the ecological footprint of one planet, right? And we have measures of uh, being able to, to uh, look at how much our consumption patterns met, uh, measures up to, you know, uh, how many planets would we consume if we uh, ate at, say, if we consume at a level of, say, an American, which is five worlds, if it's Chinese, Spanish, British, or New Zealand, you say it's slightly more than two, more than three, if it's Italian or Germany or Netherlands. So what I'd like you to do is to summarize for our audience, like what does a one planet living lifestyle look like? Yeah, one planet living lifestyle right now in, you know, as I've saw, as I saw it anyway, in Ecuador. Now, well, first I want to actually point out why I went to Ecuador specifically, because there are lots of places around the world where people are living at a one planet level in the sense that if everybody, if everybody lived like the average person in country X, Y, or Z, then then um, we'd be able to, we'd, we'd all be able to live that lifestyle with the resources that we have on the planet right now. Um, the reason that I chose Ecuador is, be, is because not only is it living at a one planet lifestyle, but it's doing, it is one of the nations that is sustainable in its level of consumption, but also categorized as having a high level of development by the United Nations. And so there's really only a handful of countries around the world that combine those two attributes. They have sustainable consumption and they have a high level of development. Um, so what that indicates is that you can have, you can have a high degree of, of well-being in a country, but have sustainable consumption as well. And we have you know, very high levels of well-being, in, but we have wildly unsustainable levels of consumption in countries like Canada, where I live, or the United States, or you know many of the other richer countries around the world. Um, that's really the key point with Ecuador. And then, what did it look like? I mean, it was it was very weird to go to a country and try to find an average Ecuadorian. <laughs> it's surprisingly difficult to do. <laughs> I mean, just imagine coming to going to Singapore and finding an average Singaporean, right? It's it's. Uh, uh, I think it would probably be quite challenging, but. But I mean, what it looked like to me was, um, I guess the other thing that's maybe surprising about it is that uh, 
when people think of a, a lower consuming or a sustainable level of consumption, they often, people in fact often use the phrase, well, you know, we're going straight back to the Stone Age if we do that. I mean, we're certainly not. Um, the lesson of Ecuador is that a sustainable level of consumption is still recognizable to us as, as a, a culture that's familiar. I mean, people are wearing clothes. There are still fashion cycles. They move more slowly. Um, there are still automobiles. Fewer people own them. They drive them less. Uh, most houses wouldn't have two or three or five of them. Um, people fly, but uh, most people do not fly or fly infrequently. Um, the, you know, it, as I put it in the book, I mean, it's, it's like the consumer lifestyle we know, but it's, it's as though it shrunk in the wash. You know, everything is just a little bit smaller and lesser and, you know, people are doing a bit less of it. Um, you know, there's kind of, again, there's no sort of, there's no magic to it. It's just the world that we know, but everybody doing a little bit less of everything, you know, fewer goods, fewer services, fewer consumer experiences. What you see replacing that is, uh, more, more, uh, community, more sort of simple practices. Lots of people just gathering in parks to talk or picnic or sing or, um, play football, particularly, um, you know, you can see that there are these low, low consuming practices that people have built in as norms in their lives, but it's not an unfamiliar lifestyle. And in fact, anybody who would remember um, the 1960s, for example, in a country like, uh, well, in North America, for example, um, it, it's a lifestyle that looks very much like that, um, entirely livable. Yeah, I can describe some of the attributes you, that you uh, mentioned. So, um... You talk about how they would still have one TV, they would have still have phones, they may not have the latest phone, but they would still have that. They would have at least a computer, one car. They wouldn't really um, dine in restaurants, yeah, but, uh, but a lot of home cooking. But the other important point that you make actually is that uh, lots of people in rich nations such as ours in North America, we do live that kind of one planet lifestyle, and that is the people who live paycheck by, paycheck by paycheck, uh, yeah. essentially, uh, not necessarily the working poor, but I guess you could say somewhat lower middle class. Right, uh, and it sounds like at least it's uh, very feasible um, to have most people living like this if they understand that we reach a certain level of equality that um, um, that everyone accepts that you know you can you know maybe have a little bit more two TVs instead of one, but you know having five or ten TVs, five or ten cars, that's uh, ludicrous. And so, what I like to bounce off as an idea for you is just like how we have. Uh, now we are seeing the, the existence of vaccine mandates. Do you think we need some kind of consumption mandate? Something that actually regulates and polices how much people should be consuming. And just to be very clear, obviously this is not actually targeted at uh, the, the poor or the middle class, but clearly the, the, the top 10% at the very least. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that idea, kind of a modern rationing type approach has been, has been raised a few times. And uh, I'm... Well, I, I suppose I'm, it's not so much that I would disagree with it as that I think it's, it would be probably very difficult to, to find any public will for. Um, what I think, to me, what's more approachable is, for example, pursuing policies that reduce inequality. Um, you know, it's really not that, it, we have really dramatic inequality in many countries around the world today. I mean, historically, abnormal uh, gaps between rich and poor. And there's really no mystery as to how to resolve that. You know, we, we know what we need to do is raise taxes on the wealthiest. And, and uh, when I looked at the United States and found that through you know, much of the 20th century, the, the tax rate on uh, that, you know, the highest marginal tax rate on the, on the wealthiest um, in, in society was 80%. I mean, that, and it's now, I think it was 37%, something like that. I, I um, think it's gone lower since Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's probably even lower now. Yeah, um, it is lower now. I mean, clearly there's a straightforward solution here, and that is to return to more historically normal tax rates when it comes to, when it comes to the wealthiest. 
uh, and across the board. I mean, um, reducing income is something that's that's really achievable. We know how to do it, and it's not historically abnormal in any in any way. The other thing that I think would be you know, really valuable, particularly in combination with the reduction of inequality, is uh, is this true cost uh, pricing approach, where you start to build in the environmental and social costs of products into the price of those products. Uh, so that, you know, for example, um, the price of making new uh, clothing would be dramatically higher than it would be to, you know, to resell a piece of clothing that had already been made. Um, if that were the case, then you have a natural uh, motivation for companies to make more durable garments because they're not going to want to, you know, they're not going to want to have to sell high, very highly priced new garments all the time. They're going to want to produce um, durable garments that people will pay a little more for and keep for a longer period of time. People are going to put those durable garments into secondhand if they don't have a use for them. Um, I think true cost, true cost pricing in combination with the reduction of inequality, uh, those are two kind of big picture things that are already, you know, there's a lot of people talking about these kinds of policies already. They feel more achievable to me than, uh, than some kind of consumption cap that I think you would see a lot of resistance to. I mean, you'll, you'll see a lot of resistance to reducing inequality too. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, but I mean, at least those are kind of on the table. Right. Uh, there's something here that I know for Ong Su and Santosh you'd be, they'd be interested to hear about, which is you spoke to a uh, a minister of uh, happiness in uh, Ecuador. And, you know, um, uh, you wrote about how uh, most of the highly developed nations don't even make the top 20 of world biggest nation, uh, nations in terms of happiness, but uh, Ecuador is the top 10, uh, makes the top 10. So can you just share with us, like, you know, what were your takeaways from speaking to someone like that? And what, what real function did he, you know, what type of work did he do really for the country as a minister of happiness? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting question because um i mean my heart was very much with the minister of happiness uh but but i could certainly also see i mean he was a very uh sharply criticized figure within ecuador and i could understand that pretty clearly as well so i mean what he was trying to do was was quite reasonably say um that it's possible to find well-being without uh without tremendous affluence and um without the need for all kinds of income and possessions and and so on right i mean he was he was making that point and and he tried to uh the, his main role was to give talks and produce publicity materials really for these sorts of ideas and encourage people to celebrate the things in their life that that had real meaning, brought real meaning to their lives, and were deeply valuable, but that didn't require uh, an abundance of of uh, spending money or possessions. The problem, of course, is that uh, many people saw that as a very comfortable, wealthy individual in a nation where there still are a considerable number of people who are you know, not even meeting their basic needs, basically saying, content yourself with your poverty. And it's a very difficult line to walk, right? I mean, it's, there's that old line that uh, the difference between poverty and simplicity is choice. And I think he, he was often, you know, he was often well, people who did not have the choice to live simply felt that he was, um, you know, he was asking them to live in those circumstances uh, without choosing to do so. So, you know, he ultimately became a pretty unpopular figure. Although internationally, he was he was quite widely admired because his message was uh, was a good one, I think, for people to hear in the wealthy nations. <laughs> but uh, a much harder sell in Ecuador, it turns out. 
Ang Su and uh, Santosh, I, I let you guys jump in, but just say one quick thing. This reminds me of a meme that's been circling on the internet where it shows like rich people like to say, oh, uh, being wealthy doesn't make you happy. Beautiful people saying being beautiful doesn't make you happy. And it just speaks to that kind of irony. Like the people who really have the gifts and the resources, they are able to have that kind of, uh, uh, well, I, I would call it hypocrisy to say that as if these things don't matter. But these things are actually precisely the, um, the, the attributes that they possess that makes them happy. So, yeah. Yeah, and also that, I mean, I think people in wealthy and privileged positions don't often realize how unhappy they make other people. <laughs> so, I mean, they may be free to say like, hey, this doesn't necessarily make you happy, but they are, they are role modeling lifestyles that, that quite literally much of the world aspires to, right? I mean, when I spoke to people in Ecuador, most of their dissatis dissatisfaction was not ultimately with uh, the specifics of their living conditions. Like it wasn't, it wasn't ultimately that they were um, feeling desperate material poverty. It was ultimately that they felt comparatively poor. Uh, they're very well aware that many other people around the world are living um, radically more affluent, more materialistic, more consumeristic lifestyles than they are. They see them on television and uh, they probably look pretty good um, to those folks. So, you know, uh, it is there is a deep irony in in uh, people who have already achieved uh Kind of the ultimate global lifestyle of our times reflecting and saying maybe i don't need all this uh, but meanwhile representing an aspiration for everybody else that's that's pretty deeply unfortunate yeah i mean i think uh you know i recently read uh tim jackson's uh latest book post growth uh and yeah no i think you know he he did say it um, that it is a particular challenge to like try and advocate what a post-growth life would look like, especially coming from someone who's already had quite a privileged position in society. And I'm not sure if he actually successfully addressed that challenge, but I think one of, one of the things he was trying to bring up was that, you know, if, if you look at what the root of happiness is, and it's this feeling of flow, one of them. I think he, he talked about um, the work of the psychologist Csikszentmihalyi and, and mm -hmm. how, you know, uh, to be in a state of flow, you actually don't need a lot of material possessions. And so I don't know, I, I, I'm holding out the hope that there could be a productive conversation between people who have had privileged lives and then who have come to realize that actually, it, at the end of the day, what matters is, let's say, these fundamental states of psychological states of flow and want you know the rest of the world to really be able to experience that and to have a conversation around okay how do we make that happen i mean first of all we need to be able to free you know uh the majority of people from you know what david graber calls bullshit jobs you know and you know what kind of social systems can we build to support more and more people being free to yeah, pursue these states of happiness. And then mm -hmm. for the people who are in a privileged position say, okay, like we, you know, we have to be willing to relinquish power and wealth in order to support the move to such a system. I mean, it would need a dialogue on that scale that was multi-stakeholder. Um, and, but yeah, I, I do hope that we can, we can have more conversations like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, maybe I'm a bit of a utilitarian thinker in this regard, but I, I do think that there's something to be said for kind of an incremental, an incremental move in this direction, right? Like a, uh, a gradual shift towards the kind of economy and society that consumes a little less um, and that gradually opens up more leisure time, for example, for people. Like if you are, certainly one of the principles that seems nearly inescapable to me is that while reducing consumption won't necessarily slow, reducing consumption in a planned way wouldn't necessarily slow economies as much as people fear that it would. I do think it slows economies down. And you know, my 
personal suspicion is that it would involve actual degrowth of economies and adaptation to that. If that's the case, if we shift from this kind of super productive economy to one that's less productive, there's obviously less labor uh, involved in it. Three things become really important. One is making sure that there is some kind of equitable access to employment for those who want to participate in that, that there is a more equitable distribution of the wealth that's produced by the economy than we see today. And then what are we gonna do with that free time? <laughs> and I think that's the upside, right? The upside is um, we finally would have this opportunity to embrace um, leisure time or time, certainly time that has a different architecture than commercial time does. And I think probably, I mean, to me, it's creating the structures that will finally actually allow us to take back some of that time that would give us the space to maybe start to move in the kinds of directions you're talking about around uh, flow states and you know, new, new psychological states, new psychological approaches to um, how, we, how we spend our time. And I mean, if you look at how people who practice voluntary simplicity, you know, I, taught, I interviewed some for the book who had been practicing voluntary simplicity for you know, two, three decades in various countries around the world. And um, that's the direction they go in, right? They, they reduce consumption. They realize they don't need as much money as they used to. There, that permits them to reduce their engagement with the cash economy and the workforce. It gives them a block of time. And the way that they use it, uh, or one of the ways that they invest it that's quite different from the way the rest of us spend our time is they invest it in, um, you know, for lack of a better term, mellow activities, <laughs> you know, simple activities, right? I mean, they, a lot of them still do pretty dynamic activities too, but they, because they have more time, they invest some of it in conversation, appreciation of art, creativity, like personal creative expression, meditation. Um, it makes space for those kinds of things. Yeah, uh, actually this, this segues quite well into uh, one of your chapters, uh, provocatively titled, um, The End of Growth is Not the End of Economics. And you know, you uh, you cited uh, your collaboration with Peter Victor, the economist, and you worked through various models about how we can get to a sustainable and equitable state of consumption. So just to summarize, the takeaway is that, uh, as you said just now, we can't uh, quickly impose a quick fix intervention of like stop shopping or no growth uh, because it can lead to devastating outcomes uh, you know, for people and, and uh, there would be surging poverty and unemployment. Uh, and government debt. Um, so that's kind of bummer for me to hear that, but <laughs> I know I'm not the expert here. Um, yeah. so, so of course you propose that instead, you know, more incrementalist, slow shopping model where uh, we, we slow down consumption at uh, a measure of GDP growth at 4% until reaching zero at 50 years later. So that, that sounds very uh, digestible and palatable. Uh, and also as a way for you to kind of study this, you went to Finland. So I'd, I'd like you to talk about that so we can have some sense of what did you take away from studying Finland? Yeah, I mean, I went to Finland because it was, it's the wealthy Western democracy that has most recently had what economists sometimes call a consumption disaster. So a, a really a, abrupt and deep drop in, in consumption, household consumption. And um, so that occurred in the 1990s and I mean, I think the main takeaway from Finland is really that um, that it, uh, these things are we can we can sustain them. Um, we can sustain these. There was no there was no mass riots. There were no uh, there was no starvation in the streets of Finland. Uh, society remained recognizable, and yet Finland was still basically doing what uh, what most countries do in our current culture whenever there's a recession, which is they basically just sit tight and wait for it to end. <laughs> you know, they, they, in fact, what they try to do, you know, currently is stimulate the economy by trying to reactivate household consumption. Um, but so Finland basically did the same thing. It, it kind of waited for the crisis to pass. It didn't make particular 
uh, it didn't take steps to reconfigure society around a permanent state of uh, lower growth or um, lower consumption, but it did. It did take steps to take care of its people, and it managed to get through that recession, uh, you know, without grievous suffering um, for most of the population. The other thing that, of course, I found interesting about Finland was just that, again, it, it showed that in these, one of the things that happens really rapidly in, um, in a consumption disaster is the disappearance of conspicuous consumption. And the, you know, particularly people who were young, who were in their 20s uh, at the time, who talked to me about it, they remember it as a, you know, really a pretty nostalgic period where it was just fine to have, you know, one couch as your only piece of furniture and no car and to wear nothing but used clothing. And a lot of people remember it as a, you know, a profoundly liberating time compared particularly to now when there are, um, there is just so much pressure in so many countries to have just the right things and to keep pace with fashion, not only in your clothing, but in your housewares, for example, or your bed linens, or, you know, <laughs> literally anything that you might, uh, that you might end up wanting to show the world on your Instagram page or in your TikTok video. Right. So, um, compared to today, the, you know, people felt a great, felt a great sense of liberation from, consumer culture. Sometimes you want to add in something before I go into something else? Because I want to go to Japan next. <laughs> no, this has been a fascinating conversation. Now in Singapore, um, we have been talking about, a group of us have been talking about this new model, equity-centered schooling, where we do social tours to help people experience transformation from inside out, not to tell them to change, but to just expose them to experiences where they can have uh, profound shifts in their consciousness and then behaviors. And personally for me, I found like profound shifts in my consciousness when I observe indigenous cultures or when I go to eco-villagers or spiritual communities, uh, um, studying monastic cultures has been amazing because the two very markers that you have been looking for, the two markers, marker number one, which was uh, low consumption and marker number two, high levels of well-being. Mm -hmm. I found these two markers of success in monastic cultures, mind you. So like in the... Buddhist and the Hindu monastic cultures, I saw a group of monastics who were so joyful, so mm -hmm. full of laughter, so much full, so much of love and care and attention and low consumption, preserving the environment. So I think, yeah, that was where, like, as an unofficial anthropologist, I found <laughs> in this monastic cultures, like, the, the two markers of... Um, success that you had mentioned and yeah and and these are not very monolithic spaces you yeah they have what we call a titrated approach to experiencing the monastic culture the monastic culture being the most extreme but they have a great a graduated approach gradations or a titrated approach where you don't need to go into a monastic and be a renounce the world entirely mm but you can still be a householder in the urban environment and still experience some of the benefits by tuning in to the lives and the talks of the monastics. And then mm -hmm. if you're interested and you've experienced the well-being, you can do a meditation silent retreat once a month or once every two months, starting with three days, then four days, then seven days, and then a month, three months, or even longer. And then finally, if you feel that's great, then you can join the Sangha of the Buddhist uh, Sangha. You can be called a householder. So you follow the precepts, but you still live 
uh, with the responsibilities of your householders' duties. Yeah. Mm. And finally, if you want to go deeper and experience full bliss of a monastic mm. lifestyle, then you renounce everything. So what I realized, these cultures, they're not monolithic. They have designed them so intricately and beautifully to allow people to slowly and gradually ease themselves into high levels of well-being and mutual aid, as well as low consumption. And mm -hmm. what we also realize in our studies in low-income communities, there's this beautiful model, it's called positive deviance model. So we were delivering a lot of humanitarian aid to low-income communities that were most impacted by COVID-19. So we were there, we were interfacing with the families, we were really amazed at the levels of reciprocity and mutual aid in low-income communities. And our conclusion from those humanitarian efforts was actually those who don't have give the most and they yep. feel good and happy with that. Interfacing and having conversation with migrant worker communities in the dormitories, they were stuck in dormitories in Singapore, mind you, like caged animals. And when we tuned in through Zoom sessions and we saw their faces of joy and happiness, we were thinking, who are the depressed ones? We <laughs> on the outside of the dormitories were far more depressed than the migrant workers who were in the dormitories. They taught us more than we could teach them. And the, they comforted us more than the words of comfort that we could give them. So mm. it was almost <laughs> so surreal to watch this and to transform our perception of aid and generosity. Yeah. yeah. And so this is, yeah, I mean, it's there's just so many, like on the spectrums of ext extremes, right? There's just so many things we could do in the urban environment as well as in the rural. And yeah, it's just amazing at the, the sum of the experiences we can expose the next generation of, uh, of leaders and youth to. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's just, yeah, I... <laughs> I'm at a loss for words. Yeah, it's been amazing. A, a <laughs> moment of great transformation for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I love this idea of uh, the kind of gradated, uh, gradated approach to these sorts of things. Because I think, I mean, clearly it's, it would be overwhelming for a lot of people to imagine full renunciation of material goods and step into a life of asceticism and, and so on. And one thing I found really remarkable when I was researching this book was discovering that the idea of voluntary simplicity actually emerged as an alternative. I mean, in a sense, it is that kind of gradated approach. It emerged as an alternative to the idea, uh, the more kind of classically historical idea of, uh, of renouncing things for spiritual reasons and, uh, and, you know, moving, very sharply in that profoundly different direction where voluntary simplicity was like, you can do, you can be, you can live a little more simply, or you can live quite a bit more simply. Um, you can choose, you know, you can start down the path essentially, but it, this is one of the most difficult things to express in, for example, you know, a media interview about this book is that it's uh, I mean, when you meet people who practice voluntary simplicity in particular, um, uh, I mean, they, they're clearly not suffering. I mean, uh, if anything, as you say, they, they show, um, they appear to be, to, to enjoy particularly high levels of well-being for the most part. They still suffer, you know, ordinary, uh, all of the ordinary concerns. Members of their family might pass away or, um, you know, they might have children who are struggling in some way or another in their lives. There's all of the usual ups and downs, but, um, but there is a sense that their well-being is quite is quite high, and research indicates that that you know certainly it's not lower than anybody else's on average. Um, but you know, I guess the thing that's difficult to get at is that they seem like they seem different than <laughs> than most of us these days, um, and different in good ways. I mean, I was very struck by the way that people who practice voluntary simplicity were so generous with their time when I wanted to talk to them. I mean, the people I interviewed would give me hours of their time. Sometimes they would sometimes have journaled out their thoughts 
ahead of time to make sure that they were, you know, really contributing something meaningful to the conversation, or it would just be a completely organic conversation that wandered in all, you know, all kinds of directions. Um, you know, in one case, a conversation that was seven hours long and, you know, went through two meals and quite a few glasses of beer and, and, uh, you know, and, and at the end of a conversation like that, you, you know, you emerge with a sense of, of, uh, of real friendship with, with the person you've been speaking to. That's not the normal journalistic experience these days. You know, the most, the normal journalistic experience these days is like you get 20 minutes of somebody's time, three weeks from when you contact them. And uh, you're certainly not walking out of there with a, with a sense of a deep bond having been built. So it's, it's the disjoint between what people who are living simpler lives seem to be enjoying people who are living simpler lives by choice anyway, seem to be enjoying and the perception of everybody else that it's something that there's something profoundly sad or that it involves some kind of deep loss is very difficult to address. You know, it, it comes up all the time. There's sort of the sense that, Oh my God, you know, if we go down this path, um, think of all we lose, think of all we must sacrifice, but your experience when you talk to those people is look at how much they've gained. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do not want to toot my own horn, but I am in some sense an exemplar of voluntary simplicity. Uh, I never heard of that term until I read your book, but for me, my initial inspiration was actually from a Japanese movement, I assume, called Minimalism. And so there's this mm. guy called Fumio Sakazaki, if I'm not wrong. Uh, his book is called Goodbye Things, and it's really startling. Like it's really stark contrast, like when he used to live a normal life and then when he uh, adjusted to minimalism, like he owned like, like less shirts than Steve Jobs, uh, you know, and um, he uh, just did about all sorts of possessions from CDs to clothes. He had only like one set of cutlery, one set of clothes for one particular function. Uh, his room was completely bare, you know, he had only one computer. I mean, he wasn't uh, a hermit. He was still very much integrated in society. Uh, but, um, you know, it was, it was really a huge drastic reduction uh, in terms of the items that he owns. And, um, and also, like, you know, when you talk about um, voluntary simpl simpl sim simpliers, right, having time for you, like, even for myself, personally, I was telling Santosh one day that um, uh, I only, like, work one hour on that particular day, and I had three conversations on that day itself. I had a conversation on this channel, had a conversation with a personal friend and another personal friend and it was like a great day for me and i felt actually blessed i'm not rich by any means uh and and but yet i felt really good that i could do this i could spend the whole day just talking to my uh you know friends and uh, and people online and it was a great fulfilling day uh for myself um and here's then my question to you is is that so for me like of course i have people around me who are rich and who have been able to witness the way i lead my life uh, but I can tell you, it doesn't look like very inspiring to them. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what I'm curious to ask you is whether, you know, in you writing this book and talking about voluntary simplicity, have you ever presented these arguments to someone wealthier? And have they ever been persuaded or offended even, you know, when you present the merits of the argument? Uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly, I certainly have, uh, I certainly have presented this argument to wealthy people. And I think generally... I guess I'm not sure that I've ever presented it to somebody who would personally identify as um, as somebody who you know revels in materialism. Um, I think I've I have had the chance to talk about it with wealthier people, but they're generally wealthier people who are probably at some level doubting the um, the meaningfulness of affluence to begin with. But it's um, I mean, the main way that I'm experiencing this, I, I suppose, is is through all of the conversations I'm having with the media, and and to a lesser extent, I suppose, to groups of people, uh, mixed groups of people, and there is this sense of almost, um, almost, almost like horror <laughs> at the idea. Of simpler living and it's extraordinary to me um i mean there is there is just this really deeply ingrained sense that 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 would be a significantly less enjoyable life um boring and and um 
yeah, just I think the main thing people fear about it is is boredom, really. The idea that it would be so humdrum compared to the the thrilling life they leave right now. And yet the other you know, probably the major complaint in the affluent societies is that they never have enough time and that they don't have enough time to do things like read or uh, even sleep enough, right? So you have this these incredible contradictions where people are saying, I desperately wish that I had the space in my life to pursue more leisure, to be able to just you know, do nothing, um, to enjoy simple pleasures. But when you present them with the possibility that they can simply do that, you know, you, they can simply take control of their lives in particular ways. And, um, and the end result will be that they will have more time and that they will be able to do those things. The idea of that lifestyle is, is uh, profoundly intimidating uh, to those people and, and, um, and something that seems deeply undesirable. <laughs> so it's a contradiction that I really, uh, I can't explain it right now. And, uh, but I'm thinking about it a lot because I'm encountering it so much. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like I can't explain it, but uh, I'll, I'll save that for maybe later. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> oh, um, well, it's simple. Like I have very close friends who, um, um, you know, I, and I want to contextualize it. So I, I'm definitely like not rich, I'm very poor. Uh, and they do try to help me out a lot with like, you know, perhaps they keep me advised on investments and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the takeaway that I get in my interactions with them is that they wouldn't want to lead my life where they're not able to go to fine dining restaurants. They're not able to mm -hmm. fly very much for uh, vacations. You know, um, some of these people take several flying trips a year. Uh, to yeah. them, the pandemic is like a form of solitary confinement to them, subjectively. Um, and I mean, even, uh, and of course, they're well-meaning people. They're not trying to sabotage the world or you know, increase the impact of uh, climate change through uh, consumption. But of course, they're just simply trying to uh, perhaps provide the best for their children. And mm. um, so they, they will find ways and means to enrich themselves, uh, you know, through the, the lens that I need to provide what's best for my children, whether they live in a penthouse, whether they get to uh, go on uh, a thousand and one enrichment causes. Uh, and there's something very prevalent in Singapore where uh, people stress a lot about bringing up their children to the best of their abilities and maximize their potential to be a productive member of society. So um, there are all these pressures um, that just simply increase, they exacerbate the contradiction, contradictions that you mentioned. They feel uh, the negative effects of not having, uh, having to slog a lot at work or uh, feeling like they don't have enough time for their own kids as well because they are putting their kids through so much tuition classes, enrichment classes, and then having to book family trips every year, which is a Singapore tradition. So yeah, all this, all this really helps to explain why if they look at, say, someone like me who just you know, wears the same uh, shirt and pants every, almost every day for work um, and doesn't own a car, doesn't own a house. Um, I look terribly undesirable. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I suppose I understand it in that sense, but, but um, do you also sense that alternative tension, right, around uh, this contradiction where it, generally the people I know who are living those kinds of lifestyles are also feeling like... Uh, they are suffering time famine and that they that they are their lives are over hurried that they are um that that they, they endure a lot of stress and anxiety um you know certainly the the people i mean it's, it's almost like an archetype of of uh of affluence that affluence certainly up to a certain point that it's it's a stressful you know, a stressful life of constant activity and constant productivity and uh, pr constant pressure to perform and to do the right thing and to own the right thing um, and to be advancing in your career and all of these sorts of things, right? So there's, there does always seem to be, on the one hand, um, I, I will hear the you know, complaints, widespread complaints in you know, in the culture I live in in North America around all of those aspects of affluence. But if you present the idea that, well, you could simply live a little less affluently. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I suppose I think that the, um, that the contradiction is mainly explained again by materialism and that the fact that, you know, if you're raised in that and it is the value set that you are 
entirely embedded in, and it is the value set that has determined, set the terms for, for how you live and how you compare yourself to others, um, how you measure success. Stepping away from that familiar value set into something completely different is, I suppose, quite terrifying. Um, and, and I suppose this is why I really like this idea of the kind of gradated approach to this, where it's like back away slowly <laughs> from, from, uh, from this thing that has, you know, that is so powerful. Okay. I just want to do a time check. We are at 12.30. Are you still okay, James, to go on? Ongsu, Santosh? Uh, yeah, I could probably go another 15 or so. Okay. Would that be all right? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, um, let me bring in this next question. I think also you'd be interested in this as well. So it's about Japan. And one of the most fascinating parts of the book was um, you uh, covered this um, family businesses, uh, which uh, in Japanese they're called Hainokian. Uh, and they have thrived for like hundreds of years uh, with no expansion. Uh, and they've been able to endure actually periods of no or low growth. Uh, the example you used in your book was this confectionery company called Tor Toraya. Uh, and it's existed since the 1600s, making it 420 years old. Uh, and uh, here's the part that's baffling to, for, for me, so I want you to explain it. Um, so you cited him as saying that it took him 30 years to turn a profit. So <laughs> how is it even feasible in this day and age? Because I, I can see what you were trying to argue about in the book, that these are like the hidden champions of the economy, right? So all these like, family businesses, mom and pop shops, independent restaurants. And uh, this also links very well to degrowth, where um, you know degrowth is not about trying to uh, turn into a non-market economy. It still will be a market economy, but mainly smaller corporations, uh, smaller companies. You know, not so much uh, expansionist corporations. But mm -hmm. you know, to me, the idea is that how do we even make this work? Because how do we actually grow this particular sector of the economy? Because it seems impossible to run for thirty years with no profit. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, to be clear, Taraya didn't. Taraya as a company didn't run for thirty years without profit. But it, when it launched, it's it's. Uh it launched a store in, in Paris. It ran that store for 30 years without right. making a profit. But that was because, the, the re, I mean, it would not have been able to do that if it cost, if it meant that Taraya itself as a company as a whole was not making a profit. Uh, it wouldn't have been able to do that. But what, what that represented to me was how clearly uh, companies like Toraya operate on completely different value sets than the conventional corporation with a growth orientation and uh, shareholders to please. So, I mean, Taraya wanted, it created a Taraya confectionery shop in and, and cafe essentially in Paris um, with the idea that they wanted to, um, they wanted to introduce Japanese confection to the rest of the world. And they thought that Paris was going to be a place that would be receptive to that over time. <laughs> I don't think they anticipated that it was going to take them 30 years to succeed, but they were so committed to that, to that purpose that, that that's what they did. They, they hung in there for, for 30 years and eventually they started to produce a small profit out of that company. But in the meantime, they were achieving the other goals that they had set for that, which was to be a kind of ambassador for Japanese culture and particularly for Japanese uh, confectionery culture. So they, um, I mean, that was what I found so fascinating about these long lived, you know, centuries old, in some cases more than a millennia old businesses was that they, you know, growth was in no way a priority for mo many of these companies. Uh, I, I, I think it, it makes a certain kind of sense, right? I mean, if you're going to exist for 700 years, for example, how are you going to grow <laughs> constantly uh, for across seven centuries? So they, they don't prioritize growth. They prioritize making a profit because without a profit as a business, they can't exist. And then they prioritize things like uh, the continuity of the business's values. Um, they prioritize things like these days, I mean, a lot of them would prioritize environmental sustainability or relationships with their employees that are strong and enduring and in some cases uh, last through several generations. It's just 
the fact that there is this whole um, subclass, I suppose, or let's just say a whole world of businesses that operate on a completely different model than the one that that were presented with day to day in the newspapers and in the media um, was fascinating to me. And to realize that it's such a substantial part of the economy too. I mean, when you start to think about how much of the economy is just these small family owned businesses who bake your pizza or fix your shoes or, um, you know, the small family owned restaurants, the small family, you know, the local neighborhood bars, none of these places grow, <laughs> you know, or many of them certainly don't, most of them, I would say. And yet there are tremendous, uh, tremendously large and significant part of, of the economy. So um, the alternative already exists, you know, it's just sort of, we haven't been paying attention to it. You have anything to add guys or? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe not about this particular, yeah, uh, thing. Um, but okay. I guess our time's drawn to close, so maybe we can. Yeah, so I, moments, but yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess what I want to say, James, is that like I, I feel like that this is a great concept that we can, uh, you know, promote a lot more because I think it helps to address um, the predicament that we're in, right? So we, we still need to consume to some degree, but we want to make sure that it's done in a way that's sustainable. And at the same time, I think that's the thing about Japan, um, and just as a kind of debate that we have in Singapore, um, sometimes we talk about Singapore not having a unique identity or having no soul, uh, mm -hmm. but in Japan, you can see that because there's a certain pride that's being placed in their unique identity, cultural identity. And obviously these local businesses are such a huge uh, facet of that, right? And you can imagine a very different Japan if they were a lot more open to foreign uh, foreign companies coming in and overtaking much of the economic landscape. And, and in Singapore, it's the reverse. We basically allow huge sorts of MNCs to come over and take over. So in some sense, we don't look very different from say New York or Sydney or something like that because we just don't have that cultural identity. But it seems to me that yes, if we want to uh, transit to that kind of economy where it's, it's a lot more made up by smaller businesses, then the government actually has to play a much bigger role, maybe even helping to uh, prop up these businesses that will take years to uh, turn profitable. So that's why I, I like this uh, idea that you brought up. Yeah, I mean, there are so many, government really helps construct the economy in so many important ways. And uh, there are so many different kinds of subsidies out there that are shaping the sorts of business models that are put in place. And I mean, shifting those subsidies around can, can you know, I, I would I would suspect could dramatically transform uh, a business landscape pretty quickly, and and I think yeah, J Japan does have this long cultural tradition of really cherishing those kinds of businesses. Um, you know, the small the small ramen house that uh, has eight seats in it and is operated every day by the by the same person. Um, alone you know those sorts of businesses are quite common in japan and, and and revered and admired and respected where i think uh in a lot of countries that kind of small business um is looked down upon as as small potatoes and um you know we really we save our admiration for people like elon musk you know with their tremendous uh, you know rapidly expanding businesses a lot of which is kind of castles in the air where you know maybe we should be paying a lot more attention to the small business person who's who's committed um who's passionate about this this tiny thing that they do well um yeah, certainly that's the kind of model that we're starting to see i mean i'm, I'm definitely hearing more and more about um, particularly young people starting small companies and brands that are really committed to making, you know, particularly when it comes to durable goods, you know, making some beautiful or well-crafted thing and being satisfied with that and finding admiration among uh, like-minded people. Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to, Probably we end this with two questions. So the first one is a more serious one and the last one is something more casual. 
Um, so this one re pertains to the part of your book where you talk about our effects of uh, consumerism on the natural world and on wildlife. Um, I actually shared this on my Facebook. It struck a chord with a lot of my personal friends about um, you know, what you wrote about in terms of what we do to other species through consumption. Uh, it's very unintentional. So whether we default an area for an apartment or, or a shopping mall, you know, but the animals, they suffer greatly. And it's very descriptive what you wrote about what happens to them, being crushed, impaled, burned alive. Uh, and then you use the example of uh, Samoa and uh, this particular interesting bird, uh, uh, Manumia. Uh, uh, Manumia, so, uh, yeah. Manumia, right. And I just yeah. want you to just kind of like summarize, just tell us, you know, what should we understand about our role in terms of how consumerism affects um, uh, animal life? Well, I mean, consumption affects animal life at every at every level. I mean, um, everything we consume is coming from products extracted from the natural environment in one way or another. Uh, and so, of course, the more we consume, the more extraction of resources has to occur. And you know, all of that extraction occurs in environments in which other non-human species make their homes. So, um, if we increase the average size of a home, for example, then we're increasing the footprint of, of, uh, of cities and towns um, and pushing out, you know, pushing out into the habitat of, of whole communities of living things. If we are uh, renovating our homes five times as often as we did 50 years ago, then uh, we're encouraging deforestation. And if we're, you know, and I mean, the story of the Manumeo was, was really striking because it, it points out that um, even when it comes to the most endangered species, when you know, long after those endangered species become a, a food, you know, are an important food product when they were, if, if in the past the, a species was more abundant and it was heavily relied on for, for food and was you know, gradually through multiple causes, pushed close to extinction, um, they will often be pushed right to the brink of extinction as, um, as luxury commodities, you know, captured as pets or captured as um, luxury food items or as, um, you know, medicines of various kinds. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's just extraordinary. <laughs> to, uh, you know, there's this, there's a book coming out, um, one of the examples I give in the book is the North Atlantic right whale, which is an endangered whale on the east coast of Canada in the United States. And one of the main, one of the two main causes of death for those whales is ship strike, which is being run over by boats. And the kind of boats that they're being run over are cargo ships. So uh, as one whale uh, conservationist put it to me, every time we hit the buy now button, you, you know, we're, we're, we're launching more cargo ships that cross the ocean and might run over one of the, you know, one of the last 400 of these whales. Um, yeah, the, every, everything we consume has those kinds of impacts. And, and uh, certainly, I mean, for those who care deeply about non-human life, uh, there's an urgency to reducing consumption and a real, and a real moral um you know, a real clear moral value in doing so. Yeah, and I think the the conclusion also from environmentalists, from the degrowth scholars that we've also studied, it's very simple. We just need to leave them alone, right? So <laughs> leave them alone, they are able to regenerate and, and grow back to very sustainable levels. And you use the pandemic uh, as an example where we decrease drastically our consumption of seafood and the tuna mm -hmm. population just experienced a huge boom. Yeah, and maybe even more shockingly, I think the the reduction of mass tourism around the globe. Um, there was just, you know, all of these many cases of uh, wildlife moving back into areas that it, you know, may not have used in in decades, just because of the sudden absence of the human presence. It was, I mean, that was very striking. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to conclude. Uh, I, I have one last fun question for you, and then Ongsu and Santosh, please come in. So my last fun question for you, uh, James, is just to uh, as such my own guilt. Should I feel guilty for buying too many books? Is is there like a pet, <laughs> uh, pattern, you know, to buy too many books, to buy more, more books of yours to give out to friends? Yeah, so that's me. Uh, Ongsu, Santosh, please jump in. 
Oh, uh, no, I, I love books. So I don't think anyone should feel guilty about buying books. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my take on that is, uh, you know, I'm very much an advocate of the idea of fewer but better things. And uh, I mean, I think that's one really concrete approach we can take to consumption, to reducing consumption. And that is to, to commit to buying fewer things, but to making sure that the things that we do consume are... Um, are durable, are valuable, will be with us a long time. Um, I guess I like to argue that uh, that the books I write, you know, could could for some people qualify <laughs> as one of the the better things they might buy. Um, I'll flatter myself with that, and and if people aren't satisfied with that answer, then there is always the library. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, so, um, yeah, Aung San Tosh, any last words then? I'd like to call it close. No, I mean, for me, a book is like a conversation with the author and that's so sacred, right? So actually you're not buying a book. You're actually engaging in a conversation with the author. You're having this very authentic and intimate space, you know, in deep introspection and contemplation with the author that's 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 what a book that is what a book represents to me it's it's a relationship it's not it's not a, a physical copy i mean it's trees maybe trees that are sacrificed at the expense of producing the paper for the book yeah so i think that's that's something that i will probably uh bear in mind if i were to purchase a book but i think it's it's a it's a relationship yeah and for me i think like something that i took away uh, from the conversation is really joy is in the mellow, it's in the inconspicuous, it's in the intangibles, it's in the mundane, and it's, yeah, it's in minimalism. Yeah, so those are like some things, yeah, and it's about cultivating small moments of joy just every single day. And yeah, I think that's, that's the, the takeaway I have from the conversation. Right. Yeah, I, I think it actually isn't a coincidence that books that that libraries were formed around books. I mean, they are actually a unique consumer item in the sense they I think they've always been recognized as that because um, there's been a recognition, obviously, for a very long time, that books uh, contain ideas that we want to have circulate. And that's why libraries were formed, right? is to is to is to give those ideas the power to circulate. And we haven't seen, as much urgency to do that with other kinds of consumer goods. So I, I think there is a credible argument that, but you know, cer certainly certain kinds of books um, are kind of stand in a class of their own as, as consumer goods. Sure, that sounds very self-serving, but I think it's true too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say that even if you, I, I'm not sure if, if I'm right on this, but I, one of the ways I try to reduce sort of somewhat my amount of possessions it's also to get stuff electronically. So I, I actually got your book ele electronically first. And then after which I just thought that I want to get a physical copy because I liked it so much and just wanted to share it with everyone. So yeah. Uh, Angsa, any last words? Then we can... Yeah, no, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. I mean, I think uh, our inspiration for naming this Breaking the Spell is we do recognize that, you know, these challenges are immense. And uh, so thank you for helping us chip away at this, you know, the spell of uh, consumerism. Yep, thanks so indeed. much. Yeah. Chip away is just the right word for it, I think. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks so much, James, for coming on. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the session. Please get the book. Uh, and I'm very sure you have a lot of uh, takeaways as well. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.